Good evening and welcome to this Approaches and Biopsychology Revision webinar for AS Psychology. Uh, we hope that you found the first of the papers on Monday uh, not too bad and with six days to go let's now turn our attention to the second paper uh, which includes some more tricky topics. So the uh, aim for this webinar is looking at approaches and biopsychology in particular. Uh, a few key aims, uh, we're going to look at what we can learn from paper one already at this early stage. Uh, we're going to try and work out what might come up in the approaches section, these are sort of some exam predictions or guesses. And then thirdly we're going to look at three key essays in the approaches in psychology section looking at the behaviourist approach, cognitive approach and the biological approach and looking for some really sort of easy ways we can evaluate all three of those uh, different approaches with three key points. And then finally we'll finish off by looking at an application question for biopsychology, a tricky application question. Firstly, what can we learn from the first of the papers that you sat on Monday? Um, interestingly, if we look at where the different marks were distributed, 31 of the marks were for AO1, which is uh, knowledge which is 43% of the paper, so slightly higher uh, than expected. 15 marks for AO2 and 10 marks for research methods, which is 35%, exactly where we'd expect it, but only 16 marks for AO3 evaluation, which would give us an indication that maybe there is more evaluation on the way in this second paper. Secondly, AQA did include three essays in this paper, which was a bit of a shock, including two 12 markers. Uh, the good news is that you can only really get two essays in the next paper because you wouldn't expect an essay to appear in the research method section. So there could be a maximum of two, but we should certainly not have three in the next paper. And lastly, I think many students found the application questions not as difficult as sample paper led us to believe they might be, which is great news. So actually, maybe the application work that we've done was helpful, and hopefully the questions will be similar in sort of style and nature to they were in paper one. So let's begin. Let's look at some sort of if we can predict anything about the, uh, the second exam and see where we think questions may or may not appear from what's appeared in the sample papers already. So on the screen now you've got the specification of approaches and biopsychology and what's particularly interesting straight away is that AQA in all of the sample papers have put an essay question on the behaviourist approach. So therefore I'd be very very surprised if we saw another behaviourist approach essay appear in the real exam. It may do but I'd be very very surprised. Secondly, what's particularly interesting is that the AO2 application questions can appear literally anywhere. They've appeared in the approaches section, they've appeared in biopsychology, they've even appeared in some research method questions. So you need to be prepared to answer an application question absolutely anywhere in the approaches and biopsychology section. The third and sort of final interesting thing from the sample papers is AQA seem to like to try and ask a question almost everything in this section. You'll see there's questions dotted all over the place um, in terms of the spec. Uh, so there's reason to believe they may well try and include a question on nearly every single one of the approaches to make sure they're testing all of the key areas in psychology. So just watch out. Don't try and revise key areas. Do try and revise everything for this particular topic. So to begin with, the first thing I want to cover in this session is looking at three essays really for the price of one, giving you a technique that you can use to evaluate three different essays with just three key points, which should be really, really useful if you're trying to cut down the revision or streamline your revision. So let's imagine you get any one of the following questions. So the first one will be describe and evaluate the behaviourist approach. The second one, same question, describe and evaluate the cognitive approach this time. And last but not least, describe and evaluate the biological approach. Now in terms of outline, what you're looking to include in these essays is how do behaviourist psychologists explain human behaviour? How do cognitive psychologists explain behaviour? How do biological psychologists explain behaviour? Okay. If we take the first essay, many of you will be familiar with the sort of key theories of classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and we'll, we'll be using those key theories to explain how humans uh, behave or learn behaviour according to those key explanations. If it was the second essay, you could use a range of different points. You wouldn't include all of these, but certainly some of them. You could talk about internal mental processes, how our thinking guides our behaviour. You could talk about schema theories. You could talk about theoretical models, which you've covered in cognitive psychology. The use of the multi-store model, working memory model, or two examples of theoretical models. Or even the use of the computer model, computer analogy, the idea that the human mind is a bit like a computer. If it was the biological approach, you could talk about any of these key things. So you could mention genes, how we inherit behaviours from our parents. You could talk about biological brain structures, how different parts of the brain are responsible for different behaviours. You could talk about neurochemistry, um, how neurochemical imbalances in terms of things like serotonin and dopamine can change our behaviour. And if you wanted to be brave, you could even talk about evolution, although I'd probably avoid the last one. 
Now, the beauty with these essays is once you've done the outline, we can actually learn three key evaluation points that you can use for every single one of these essays. Remember, I always make the point that actually we're looking for effective evaluation, so you should focus on the quality of the evaluation, not the quantity. So it's not about the number of points you write, it's about how well you write them. However, that being said, there are three key points that could be used for any one of these essays. The first one is the application of the approach to treating psychological disorders. All of these approaches have led to a key treatment for a certain psychological disorder. For example, the behaviourist approach has led to systematic desensitisation, which treats phobias. The cognitive approach has led to CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, to treat depression. And the biological approach has led to drug treatments to treat things like OCD. So that application is a great point. The second thing we'd try and do in all of these essays is bring in some research support. Now what I've tried to do here is not bring in any new research, bring in research that you've learned from other areas of your course which you'll see as we go through the points. So I'm not bringing in anything new, no new knowledge, just points that we will have learned in psychopathology, um, things that you should already know. Last but not least, and a really nice easy point that you can always use, is that all of these theories are limited in some way. Um, some students have got into the habit of using the term reductionist. I would avoid this term because it's often used incorrectly. Simply use the term limited. To give you an example, the behaviourist approach is limited. It says we learn all human behaviour when actually there are biological explanations that it's ignoring. So it's not taking into account those other factors. Okay, And we'll talk more about that in this session. So these three points, key points can be used to evaluate all of these essays. So learn these three and you've got a structure for every essay that could come up in this particular part of the exam or these three at least. So let's look at that first essay, describe and evaluate the behaviourist approach. Many of you will know about different key theories, classical conditioning from Pavlov, uh, Skinner's sort of operant conditioning and researchers that go with it. So what we're trying to do here is outline the behaviourist theory, what, how we explain behaviour according to behaviourist psychologists, um, using these key ideas. But we don't want to spend too much time outlining. We want to get the key elements of the theory in, in 100 to 150 words. We don't want to be going any further than that. So to give you an example how that might look, so let's do the first part. Let's do classical conditioning. Um, I might start with a small introduction. So the behaviourist approach believes that all human behaviour can be explained in terms of learning, that's key, uh, which is known as conditioning. And this includes two types, classical and operant. That's what I'm going to talk about in my outline. I would go on to say in Pavlov's original experiment with dogs, what he did was he continually presented a bell, I might throw in the key term there, a neutral stimulus, with food, an unconditioned stimulus, which caused the dog to salivate, an unconditioned response. Eventually the dog associates, and that's key, the sound of the bell and the food so that the sound of the bell alone would cause the dog to produce saliva. Okay. Now I've underlined a bit at the end here which is really, really key. Many students would stop here, go on further and explain what does that show us. What Pavlov's research shows us, or what his experiment shows us, is that we can actually teach animals and humans, the argument is, to learn an innate reflex behaviour through association, through conditioning. Okay. The reason it's innate and it's a reflex is because the dog can't control producing saliva. It happens naturally, so it's an innate behaviour. It's a reflex. There we go. We've explained Pavlov's theory in around 70 words there. We want to do exactly the same for operant conditioning, bringing in some more key terms to finish off our outline. So you might say that operant conditioning explains the learning of voluntary behaviour through positive and negative reinforcement. I'm just going to define those two key terms. Positive reinforcement occurs when a behaviour produces a consequence that is rewarding, whereas negative reinforcement occurs when the behaviour removes an unpleasant consequence. Okay, Both of these two things, positive and negative reinforcement, make us more likely to do something again in the future. Okay, So if a teacher praises you for doing your homework, in theory you'll be more likely to do your homework again because you want that positive reinforcement. That's your outline done. Let's now turn our attention to these three key burger paragraphs that I mentioned and see how they work in an essay like this. So to take the first one, the application of the approach to treating psychological disorders, um, we're going to use our burger techniques. We'll start with our point. One strength of the behaviourist approach is its application to the treatment of phobias. Let's bring in the evidence. Where is the evidence to support that? Well, classical conditioning has led to the development of what's called systematic desensitisation, which is a treatment to help reduce anxiety associated with phobias. It's all you need to say. That is the evidence. Why does that matter? And as I always say, start with this matters because. Well, the reason it matters is because it's an effective treatment for a range of different phobias and demonstrates the utility, that just means how useful it is, of the behaviourist approach to help improve the lives of people with phobias. So the reason it's a good thing is we're improving the lives of people. That is a strength. That's your first evaluation point. Application. 
We're then going to bring in some research support. Okay, So our second evaluation point is all to do with research support, and I'm going to use a study you know. So here's your point. Another strength of the behaviourist approach comes from research by Watson and Rayner. They demonstrated the process of classical conditioning in Little Albert, who was conditioned to fear white rats. What they did was they uh, used to strike, or they were striking a steel bar behind Little Albert's head every time he reached for the white rat, which was a neutral stimulus to begin with. Eventually, he formed an association so that the rat became a conditioned stimulus, which produced a fear response. He became scared of animals like little white rats, okay? Interestingly, he generalised that fear to other sort of white fluffy objects, including a Santa Claus mask as well, through generalisation. Again, we need to say why that matters for the behaviourist approach. Remember, we're linking back to the behaviourist approach. Well, this matters because it supports one of the key ideas, classical conditioning, and it shows that it is involved in the learning of an innate reflex behaviour, in this particular case, a phobia or fear response. So there's your second Virgo paragraph on research support. Last but not least, I've probably saved the, the easiest one till last. We're going to talk about why the theory is limited, OK? The fact it doesn't take into account other theories or explanations. So to give you an idea, one criticism of the behaviourist approach is that it doesn't take into account other factors, for example, cognitions. That just means thinking. Here's my evidence to support that, bringing in the other theory, OK? The behaviourist approach ignores the role of thinking in the learning of behaviour and suggests that only behaviour which we directly observe should be measured. Okay, that's what they believe. However, cognitive psychologists believe the complete opposite in a way. They say that no, we can study what goes on in the mind, our internal mental processes, scientifically. Well, why does that matter? Well, it matters because actually the behaviourist approach isn't therefore providing a complete explanation of human behaviour. We're ignoring other factors, thinking, which might play an important role in some behaviours. And therefore, the approach is limited in its application to all human behaviour. And it's as simple as that, okay? So if I'm going to go back now, you'll see we've got these three key evaluative points that we've just used for the behaviourist essay. And in a moment, we'll see exactly the same thing, how they apply to the cognitive essay. So let's imagine now you've got the second of these questions. Describe and evaluate the cognitive approach, okay? Many different key assumptions you could use here. You could talk about internal mental processes shaping and guiding our behaviour. You could talk about schema theories, this idea that we organise knowledge into packets of information in order to guide us through our everyday life. You could talk about theoretical models, uh, that is things like the multi-store model, the working memory model. These are sort of pictorial representations of how processes look in our brain, in our mind. Okay? Or you could talk about the computer model, the idea that our brain is much like a computer. Okay? So to give you an example, the keyboard and the mouse would be the inputs like our senses. The monitor would be the output like our behaviour. The hard drive would be our long-term memory. Okay? I probably wouldn't use the last one. I'm not a fan of the use of computer models, but if you like it, go ahead and use it. Now, instead of talking you through the outline, I've actually, on the handout that accompanies this session available on tutor2u.net, I've already written you an outline for this. So we're not going to talk in depth about how to outline this essay. Here's one I wrote for you earlier. Let's get straight into the, what we're trying to achieve in this session, which is how do we then bring in these same evaluation points, OK? So let's go back to our first one, the application of this approach, now the cognitive approach, to treating psychological disorders. Again, we make a very similar point here. We just change a couple of words. We say one strength of the cognitive approach is its application to the treatment of depression. Okay? The study of internal mental processes has increased our understanding or improved our understanding of why people develop things like depression through faulty thinking or negative schemas, which has in turn led to the development of CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, which is a treatment. Why does this matter? Exactly the same reason we said before. It's an effective treatment, in this case for depression. It demonstrates the utility, the usefulness of this approach, and it's helped improve the lives of people with depression. Exactly the same reason. Application done. Moving on to research support, okay? I'm going to use a study here from psychopathology, which we're going to cover in tomorrow's webinars, okay? Um, another strength of the cognitive approach comes from research by Bowery et al. in 2001. He found that patients with depression were much more likely to misinterpret information negatively, they had a cognitive bias, and feel hopeless about their future. They had a negative thinking triad, okay? So that links into the idea of internal mental processes shaping our behaviour. Why does this matter? Well, it supports the idea that cognitions, thinking, is involved in the development of certain behaviours or psychological conditions, in this case depression. And there's your research support, really simple point. 
Moving on to the third one, it's limited. This is the last one I'm going to do for you. Okay, we'd say one criticism of the cognitive approach is that it doesn't take into account other factors. And I'm going to let you write this one on your handouts. So to give you sort of an idea, you'd say, for example, it ignores the role of biology. It doesn't take into account genes, hormones, and so forth. Okay, so that would be what things it ignores. Why does that matter? It's the same answer as before. It's an incomplete explanation of human behaviour and it doesn't take into account other key theories and ideas like biological explanations that account for certain behaviours and traits. And that is it again. We've used those same three key points, OK? Now, for the final part, I'm not going to talk you through this one, actually. What I've done on the tutor to you website is I've created a handout for you to try and do this one yourself, OK? So I've given you all the key information you need about genes, biological structures, neurotransmitters, etc. And I think you should try and write your own outline, bringing in two or three of those key ideas. And then I want you to follow this exactly the same structure, OK? This exact same structure. Look at these three key evaluation points, application to treatments, research support and limited, and try and write your own three burger paragraphs. And what you'll find is that you'll have the skills at this point to go ahead and tackle any one of these three essays. Quick recap. So if you get any one of these essays, if it was describe and evaluate the behaviourist approach, your key ideas are things like classical conditioning, operant conditioning, if you get the cognitive approach, I would choose these three. Talk about internal mental processes, schema theory and theoretical models. And if you get the biological approach, I would discuss genes, biological structures, neurochemistry. So you've got to learn your AO1. But the beauty is with these essays is these same three burger paragraphs at the bottom here you can use for any one of these essays. So the application of the approach to treating psychological disorders, research support, and it's limited. It's ignoring other factors. And that is it. Let's move on. Final thing for today to look at a, a tricky application question that appears in biopsychology. Let's imagine you get the following question. So Jeremy is digging in the garden. He uh, feels the spade hit a rock and he stops digging immediately. Explain how sensory relay and motor neurons would function in this particular situation. Okay. Now when you see the following three words in a question in this situation, it means it has to be an application question. You've got to apply back to Jeremy and his really interesting example of digging in the garden. So you must apply it to the stem, the extract. Okay. As always, I always recommend highlighting your extract to pick out the key information you could use in this question. So the first thing is going to be the fact that his spade hit a rock, so he feels that. There's a sensation there. It's going to link to sensory neurons in a moment. And he stops digging immediately. That's going to be the muscle response, his motor neuron. Let's see how we would answer that as a question. So first type of neuron, sensory. We're going to say what a sensory neuron is. It sends information from the senses to the brain. Here sensory neurons in Jeremy's hand would feel the spade hitting the rock I've quoted there in bold and send the information to the brain. Moving on, you then talk about relay neurons. A bit tricky here because there's nothing to really apply to. We've got to make up a bit of application. So relay neurons pass messages from sensory neurons to motor neurons and are mostly found in the brain. Okay. What Jeremy's relay neurons are going to do is decide how to respond to this information. Okay. We haven't taken that from the extra, but that's what they're going to do. Last but not least, we need to bring in our motor neuron. So motor neurons pass messages from the brain back to the muscles. Here the message was passed from his brain to his arm muscle to tell him to stop digging immediately. And you'll see how I've quoted the second bit from the extract. This will be an effectively answered question, bringing in, getting you into the top mark band, so five or six out of six, because we've got all the key elements. We've explained the three types of neurons and we've linked explicitly back to the extract, which is what the examiner is looking for. And that is it. Thank you for watching this webinar. Any questions, feel free to tweet us or email me directly at joseph at tutorsu.net. And remember that we've got two more webinars this week, tomorrow night on psychopathology, Thursday night on research methods, and we look forward to seeing you then.